Alex, I've missed you on the podcast. It's been a minute. I know. It, we've been working hard on a really fun project, mm -hmm. but a project that takes a lot of preparation, mm -hmm. a lot of accuracy with every single word that comes out of my mouth. Um, and so I am tremendously excited to have just a normal podcast where I get to sit and have conversation with you. I'm very excited for that as well. While I have been having the gym girl chats where I've just been able to be a little bit more casual, it's just something about being in person and chatting with you that is always very nice. And even though it's something that we have been recording podcasts together, they haven't been out for everyone to listen to. And we haven't just been able to chit chat. I know. Do we want to... what? How much of a uh, little teaser can we give for this project that we have been, I mean, putting so We've much time dogs. into? <laughs> a woof woof. A woof woof. <laughs> uh, as much as you want. I mean, this is our podcast. This our is rules. true. Um, this project has been one that has probably been the most requested from listeners. Mm -hmm. uh, we have actually done this project before. We have taken it up a... 10x notch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we have we have really amped things up for you guys and I am so excited for you guys to hear the quality of resource that we're going to be providing to you all for free. Um oh my gosh, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be lit. The only thing that we ask of you all is that when this project starts and you guys will know more of the details sooner rather than later. I just ask that you share every episode. Please. <laughs> share it with everyone that you know. It is going to mean the world to me uh, for you to share it. That is all I ask of you when listening to this episode. Take in all the information, but we have been busting our tails to get this to come to life, and we are so close to finishing it and giving it to you all. Um, please share the podcast. Yes. And it's been a whole team effort as well, yeah. not just between Alex and I, while we have put a lot of effort into making sure all the notes are correct and recording and being able to get different guests on the podcast as well. But it has been a lot from the whole team. And it just makes me very thankful for Team PD because could not do this big of a project without extra hands involved. Yeah. So very excited for that. And I know he said once it comes out to share, you can still share episodes yeah, sh now. Share now. <laughs> and you can also give us a rating on Apple Podcasts. Go ahead and give us a review. Let us know how you're liking it. And we'll just keep rocking and rolling. But do you have any updates that, since you've been on that you want to give? Anything new in life? Um, I didn't end up running the half marathon. Mm -hmm. Miguel did and crushed it. Miguel crushed it. Um, there is another half marathon that's in town in October. So we're kind of shifting the focus to that. And there's a, a couple of 10Ks that I am aiming for to be ready to go, not dealing with any injuries right now, zero injuries, and also running at a pace that is much more tolerable and working on my overall frequency of running, um, which has been great. I just got stitches in my head. I had a, a cyst removed from my temple, um, which has had me away from running for a little bit of time. I did not think that f five stitches was going to <laughs> prohibit me from running for two weeks, but that's where we're at. I did run very lightly yesterday <laughs> and felt okay. <laughs> um, but that's really the the main update. Clients are crushing it. Uh, I've we've we made some additions to the team since the last time I was on, and I'm just really proud of the the family and and team that we're creating within physique development. The culture is amazing, and it's just a group of people that I enjoy working with on a day to day basis. I've never had this many touch points or, or conversations with staff members on a regular basis. Day to day, I'm talking to multiple people, which mm -hmm. normally I'm just behind the scenes working with clients. Yeah. Like I'm which just you're going- still talking to multiple people yeah. because of your clients, but your clients and communicating with a whole team um, where it just is like a whole whole ass business. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's become something that I'm tremendously proud of, of course, but I'm really grateful for just the people that we get to work with. Yeah. And it was really cool. Uh, yesterday, actually, I had two or three people on staff that are part-time right now. Um, they were actually talking to each other and talking about how like their dream and their goal was to go full-time and to be able to be full-time with PD. That's amazing. Uh, and it was just an extremely rewarding thing to hear because it's obviously 
sometimes people only want to be part-time. They're doing other things. Completely understand that. Um, and because I love the team, I'll take people how I can get them. Uh, but being able to hear like some people's overarching goals, like I want this to be my full gig. This is the mission. This is the company that I believe in. It just like brought me to tears, honestly. Let's go. <laughs> Let's work <fucking> go. <laughs> so, yeah. But today I thought we could talk about some of the natural tendencies that we have or have had and things that we are working on to, to detrain in our day-to-day -day lives. So starting that off, do you have something that comes to mind? The first one that comes to mind for me is probably patience. <laughs> <laughs> I could agree with that. I am a very naturally unpatient person, person, impatient, <laughs> impatient person. Um, this has been something that has been a large focus over the last, you'll probably be a better testament to this. When Your have you seen life. the improvement? I mean, <laughs> oh, I understand my whole life. <laughs> Uh, the improvement, I would say it's been obviously steadily improving for multiple years, but I would say in the past year or two has been where I've seen bigger strides for you overall, um, and even more so in the past six months. Um, and even just talking about like having the stitches and patience within that, Alex a few years ago would have said, forget what the doctors say, I'm immediately going to go train. And for you to give it a full week, I know it said two weeks, but for you to give it a full week and truly listen to what was being told and then take it as easy as you did, that is like patience so exemplified in you of like that wouldn't have happened a year or two ago. Right. Uh, so I would say that in the past six months have been some of those bigger strides of just being able to be more patient with yourself, mm -hmm. patient with uh, the different moving parts of a team and just being able to, even within outside conversations that you have or conversations um, that you just have in general of being able to have more patience instead of being as reactive to things. Because I think that's where patients come and to play as well is it's like instead of having those emotional reactions of being able to kind of pull into yourself and be like, okay, we saw, how am I going to respond to this? Yeah. I, I was going to say that the, I think the first step to improving my patience was addressing my anxiety because the impatience was probably stemming from my internal dialogue within my anxiety of all the things that I have right now could be ripped away at any second. So then this pushed me into a place where if everything wasn't going perfect or was not in a very linear fashion improving, then I was becoming very anxious and worried. And that was evoking the impatient response to everything. And then that was going to lead to the emotional responses of being frustrated, um, greater temperament, whatever the case may be. Um, so my patience is something that is just continuing to uh, improve and looking at a time horizon for different things that is much longer than what I would have previously, I think also helps tremendously. So for example, within the runs, it could have like, I'm sure that there's a half marathon that I could jump into much sooner. Mm -hmm. um, but the target of October feels very attainable for me. Um, and it also feels as though that I'm not in this just mad dash rush with something that I really enjoy. And previously, I would probably push myself to have that mad dash, to have the anxiety and kind of feed off of the anxiety to get to the, the goal in a very hindered way. I'd, I'd have more injuries. I would have many moments where I was just like living off of adrenaline and motivation and like uh, stimulants, so on and so forth. Whereas now looking out to October, I have a real game plan that's sustainable, adherable, and I have a gradual progression that's going to allow for me to accomplish my goal in October of running a specific time and so on um, that is not evoking this impatient or um, anxiety-ridden approach. Mm -hmm. And now with you saying that dealing with your anxiety, what was one of the first things to deal with your anxiety? I would say the first thing, and, and I've brought this up on the podcast before, but working through my breathing, mm -hmm. like really allowing myself to breathe deeply and exhale. And also being in this place where I'm not so rushed to make a decision on 
things that are presented to me because I, I think that a large part of anxiety is just rash reactions to different things that are coming on. And I do think that that's my personal experience within anxiety. There's so much that people can experience when it comes to anxiety that it can come from so many different ways or experiences of their life. Um, but that's been my overall experience is that mine was painfully emotionally driven of responding to things too rashly, too quickly, um, and letting my emotion be the dictating force in those decisions or those responses. Mm -hmm. And I think that another thing when I look at you and your personality and just the time that I've known you as a whole is that you have adopted the thought process of you work best when your feet are to the fire. And I think that there is a lot of truth in that. Like I'm not taking away the fact that sometimes you need to put your feet to the fire to get something done, but it's kind of like this mindset of, oh, I'm a procrastinator and I just need to get to really close to the timeline to like push myself to like get everything done. And so you'd put yourself on purpose under this immense amount of pressure or this very short timeline to then try and hack or trick yourself to get everything done, where I feel like you've been able to work on some different things within your scheduling, within your routine, um, within your breathing, of course, different aspects like that that have allowed you to recognize of, I don't need to believe this about myself, that I need to put myself in this crunch time. I can have more time with this and be able to plot out what makes sense for everything that's going on, especially since now you've always juggled a lot of responsibilities, but you've only increased your responsibilities over the years. And so it's something that to my, from like the outside looking in, it's kind of the aspect of I can't do it with this many responsibilities and just kind of putting myself under that. I need to be able to show up in these different ways. I look at it more as a, a tool rather than depending on it as my only tool. Mm -hmm. uh, it was probably the the tool in my toolbox of skills that was the most beaten and battered because I would depend on it so much. Um, and I think a reframe that I was able to utilize was if if I'm so dependent on this crunch time, like I can self create this crunch time if I need to. I can say like, I only have these two hours to work on this thing and I can be very efficient in this two hours to accomplish whatever the goal was. Um, and so not being dependent as well as not telling myself that I'm a procrastinator. Mm -hmm. Just stop putting that over myself was a huge step in the right direction. I'm really big on what you're putting out of, of speaking over yourself is tremendously important of what is actually going to transpire. Um, you you know, people saying that they are, that they're poor. I am so poor. I'm so poor. It's like you are continuing to speak that over yourself. Like no matter what, whether you have a gajillion dollars or zero dollars and you keep speaking that, it's just going to feel the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I find how we're talking about ourselves to be tremendously important. And so just removing the notion that I am a procrastinator at all. Um, and not associating myself with that whatsoever and doing the things that I know people who do not procrastinate, they do. I'm just emulating the examples that have been shown to me to be successful and I'm following what ends up working for me. Some of the things that I've implemented from others that do not procrastinate has not worked for me and that's okay. But some of the things that I have implemented has been useful. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we're looking at the aspect of like speaking things over yourself, there's research that even talks about this. And especially since this is mostly about health and fitness on the podcast about dieting of someone can be in their mind thinking that they're dieting, even if they aren't actually in a caloric deficit and their body does show all the signs of dieting, not actually losing weight, but all of the signs of long-term dieting and having chronic issues because you've been in the mindset that you're dieting. So there is a lot to show past that, of course, that what you speak over yourself or what you tell yourself can become true. Um, and same works in the opposite way of uh, we've talked about manifestation before and how you are a master uh, manifester, but it is so much of just putting something out there, saying you're going to accomplish something to then 
continue to lead you towards that. Obviously, it's not just I say one thing and then it happens and that's manifestation. It's like I say something and then I take the actions or do the things that I think someone who accomplishes that would do. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible. You, you should you. lift type. High reps. Carbs are weight. needed. Keto squats are bad for your Squats needs. are great. You for should your squat ass for toes. It's fine. It fits my macros. It's for idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one on one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. I can agree. So what's the, um, what is the trait for yourself that you feel like you've worked so hard to detrain? Uh, well, there's another one that I want to dig into because it's like the most overarching of my life. But I would say, and honestly, this one kind of is too, but especially if I'm talking about in the past year, the biggest thing that I've been working on to detrain is my time blindness. Mm. Now, this is something that comes along with ADHD, but this also also goes with talking things over yourself of just because I have ADHD and it is a fact that I have a hard time with time and having time blindness doesn't mean that that has to be my reality for the rest of forever and not using that as an excuse of, oh, I'm always late because I have ADHD, so I have time blindness or I'm behind on that because I'm time blind. It's like, yes, that could be true, but it doesn't mean it needs to continue to determine every single thing in my life. And so that's something that I've really worked on scheduling and being so deafening, honest with myself about how long things take because I would maybe schedule beforehand and then I would think, well, why is all of this not happening the way that I want it to? And it's like, you literally gave yourself 30 minutes for something that takes an hour. And so that pushed back your horse whole schedule. And you likely did that multiple times throughout the day without also understanding within where my role is within the business. There are things that come up. And so I also need to have buffer times in place of, hey, does someone need something from me? Do I need to hop on a quick call? Do I need to take care of something? And it's that I just need to put that buffer in. And the great thing is, if I don't end up needing it, then I just have extra your time to do different things that I either want or need to do instead of being in this place where I felt constantly behind. Now, of course, there are still days I feel behind. I am a human being with a lot of things that I am juggling, but it has been in such a better spot. And that has in turn also largely helped my anxiety because I was self-inducing so much anxiety by just not doing the thing that was going to actually help me. And I think that that is, uh, I had posted semi-recently of a question that I often ask myself, which is, how much are you playing a role in your own suffering? And sometimes that can be a really hard question to ask yourself because you have to be honest with yourself. But um, you, I'm so glad to be surrounded by you because we both have the mentality of like, you can't just be a victim and you can't just complain and you have to look inward. And so that's something that has continued to drive home to me of if I feel like I'm just really struggling, really having a hard time of asking myself, how much are you playing a role in this? Because there's always going to be outside factors. There's always going to be things that you can't control, but there's a lot of things that you can control and what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So even the aspect of one of the examples I gave in the post was that I wasn't getting to sleep at a good time. And I was purposely staying up late, knowing I was staying up late, knowing that was going to affect my next day, knowing that was going to affect my sleep, knowing that sleep affects every single process in the human body. I was doing doing all of that knowingly and willingly. And then I was wondering, why is my digestion off? Why am I inflamed? Why am I stressed? Oh my gosh, there's just so much to do. Yes, there is so much to do, but you are making it so much worse by not doing the things that you know you can control and you can do within your schedule and having different boundaries in place or just being able to, again, schedule your day correctly so that you have time to wind down um, instead of I got in a place of saying yes to so many things because I wanted to be timely with things. But I have now 
really been in a better spot of understanding priorities of, yes, I still need to be timely, but I also need to be able to really put into order what priority goes first, what thing needs to get done first, what thing would you like to be done in a certain time. And I've also found that as long as I communicate with people about what's going on, it's okay that times might change a little bit. Uh, And that's something where I used to really have a hard time changing uh, something that was already scheduled and feeling like, oh, we've already scheduled this. I can't change it. And it's like most of the time when I reach out and I'm like, hey, either this deadline needs to change or can we change this meeting? Most of the time people are like, yeah, I'm good with that. And it's also something that as soon as I know something isn't going to work, I immediately contact someone instead of like waiting up until the last second and being like, hey, I'm actually going to be 30 minutes late to this because I've been in that situation and that can be so frustrating to your schedule. If it's like you knew this three hours ago or you knew this three days ago, if you could have told me, I could have easily moved it. But now I'm kind of stuck in this weird limbo of trying to get everything done. Yeah. There's so much to unpack there. Let's let's start with the the scheduling and creating a schedule that's truly attainable. Um, what did you change to to go from the place of, oh my gosh, I'm so overwhelmed. I have this many things to do today to now I know what I'm actually going to do today. And I've got a better focus of where my feet are. This is the thing that I'm focused on. I'm not dwelling on this massive to-do list per se. I'm focused on my singular task because I know that my day is laid out in a way that's accomplishable. Mm -hmm. There's a few things that I've done. And like Alex mentioned earlier of their things that uh, he looked at people doing that aren't procrastinators and some of them worked for him and some of them didn't. And it's very interesting as well because there's a lot of things that work for me that don't work for Alex and vice versa. And so it's very interesting when I'm like, I feel like I've figured things out and I like talk about it to Alex and he's like, that would absolutely absolutely 0% work for me. Uh, So I do use a platform called Asana. We use that for a lot of team stuff, but they do have a free version. And I use the thing I use the absolute most on Asana is the tab called My Tasks. And it's basically, you can lay it out in different ways, but I have it laid out for the week view. And it's great because I used to be a pen and paper gal of everything was pen and paper. Now, I still always have pen and paper on my desk. And I love to be able to have that, take notes how I need to, but I do not host my main to-do list on that anymore because I found with so many things going on, it was first hurting my mentality because I would write it down. It would either get missed when I turned the page and I forgot to move it to the next day or moving it to the next day felt like a failure because I'm having to like cross out on paper. That's like a me thing. I've always really hated like crossing things out on paper. And so being able to move it to Asana is great because I not only have everything color-coded, But it's also something that if I use it in tandem with my Google Calendar, so Asana and Google Calendar are my BFFs, um, that it's something that my Google Calendar might be a little bit more vague. And then the Asana is a lot more like organized, where my Google Calendar might have a time block and say, Sue check-ins, but my Asana is going to have each individual check-in that I need to do. And so it's really great because, again, not only can you color code it, but you can reorganize it in the day. So each night um, before the next day, I'll go through the next day and make sure, okay, double check everything that's there, double check it against my calendar and reorganize it. So I'm not like sorting through this list. I know my order of importance or the order of my schedule as I go through it. And it's something where I, you can like check it off. And so I still get the satisfaction of like checking it off and being able to move it um, on my list. But it's great because if something needs to move in a day, I can just move it and it's all good. And all the information is there. Everything's all set. So it's really extremely helpful for me. Like I could go on a whole tangent of how much I love Asana, but it is so great for me to see everything. And even just uh, the other day, I was talking to a client about it and the aspect that I will also have some things on my Asana daily list that are like, okay, these are five things that like, if I have time, if I by chance finish things early or things take less time, then I'll get to these. And I put it on that day just because I normally am like really focused on that day. But it's great because I can kind of have those chill in there as I'm looking through my to-do list. Uh, Maybe I have like a 30-minute random block in there. I can be like, can I get one of these things done? But it's also great because if I am overwhelmed of like, 
okay, there's a lot to get done this day, a lot to do. I can just ease my mind of I'm going to move these to a different day, get them off my to-do list. Now I have this. And it just brings things down in my mind to see it all laid out, to see what that looks like. Um, and then using that again in tandem with my Google Calendar to really gauge time. And I really try to self-audit of if I recognize the day didn't go how I had quote unquote, planned it to go to look at, okay, were there things that I did that I was off schedule? Was it that I woke up late? Was it that I spent too long on something? Was it that I spent time on something that I shouldn't have spent time on? Was it because something ran over? What was the reason? So then I can accurately plan for the next day or change a time if I need to. So one thing was like getting ready for podcasts and like doing my hair and makeup and stuff. I used to only a lot an hour. And so Someone listening to this might be like, oh my gosh, you need an hour to get ready? And it's like, yes, I do. But I actually have now ended up almost always budgeting an hour and a half. And that again goes to I'd rather have a buffer and be done early and be able to do something else than maybe making all of you guys wait, being late, being rushed, feeling anxious, and feeling like I'm letting people down, letting myself down. And it's Again, something where a lot of times I will finish things early, but I will tell you, it is such a better feeling to finish things early and have extra time than to jam pack way too much in a day and feel like a failure at the end of the day because you did not get what you thought you were going to get done that day. And that has been a huge lesson to me is just budget the extra time, even if you would have loved that it took you less time, just put that in there. And there's multiple sections throughout my day that there's always a buffer, including like eating. I always put eating in my calendar for an hour long. Normally eating will take me around 30-ish minutes, but sometimes I'm finishing up a project. I'm talking to someone on the staff. I am, my, maybe my mom's coming by, whatever it may be. And it just helps me of like that whole hour's buffered in there. So I'm not ending up being like, now I need to push everything back in my day. It's like, oh, I'm I'm still intact. I'm still in a good spot. Yeah. Um, for the planning side, we're not that far off. I, I use the Google count. The Google calendar is my main thing, mm -hmm. but I also have less total different task than you do. I have more, I spend more time on specific things, but I only do a handful of specific things. So it's better for me to have more of like a, a power list of three to five things that I'm doing that particular day. And then I have a, uh, what I call an under 30 minute list of tasks that are like around the house of putting away laundry, doing stuff maybe outside or whatever the case may be calling X, Y, and Z person. Um, so that's how I, I have my written list and then I have the Google calendar that dictates my entire life. And you know, if you, even if you don't work with your significant other or anything, having a shared Google calendar is a game changer. So, I, I mean, when I make this recommendation to people, some people look at it and get so overwhelmed and I'm like, it's so simple. I don't know. Or they think they're like, well, I don't work with the person. So it's not that important, whatever it may be. I don't care if it's like both of you have work nine to five and that's all blocked off. It is so nice to be able to look and be like, oh, I'm about to go on a walk. What is Alex doing right now? Or um, I'm about to eat. What is Alex doing right now? Or even just looking ahead at your schedule and being like, oh, he has a big day. If I can get his meals ready for him, this is really gonna help him out. And it's just, we used to like have to repeat things to each other so many times. And we'd be like, what does your day look like today? What is this happening? And then it would just be irritating for both of us. Yeah. So when it comes to the communication, uh, what, what has, or what steps did you take to improve upon that? Whether that be the communication of talking to other people when rescheduling things or just the communication in general, maybe. I think that when it came to the rescheduling, it was just the aspect of recognizing the biggest thing was having respect for someone else's time and that someone can't know something that they don't know. And that was huge for me of I would carry a lot of stress and anxiety on my own shoulders that I didn't necessarily need to, but it was because I was, I don't know if it was necessarily that I was worrying how other people are perceiving me, but it was just the aspect of wanting to like show up so much for other people that I ended up 
like taking it on a lot emotionally myself where an example of being like having a stressful week. I had a week that I had to fill in for our um, our enrollment advisor. And it was something that I that was going to be like 20 plus hours I had to add to my week on a week that it felt like I didn't have any extra time. And past Sue would have just been overwhelmed by it. And then anyone who messaged me that week on the team or a friend or whatever, I would have been very like as soon as they message me be like why are they messaging me they don't i'm so overwhelmed i can't get back to this and taking on all of this when it's like they don't know that i'm overwhelmed they don't know what i'm going through and so just being able to say to the team or say to a friend hey i have like a really busy week if i'm acting different or if i don't get back this is why and even if someone else doesn't need that from me like maybe you're like i i don't care you don't need to message me that it helps my peace of mind and me to just be like they know what's going on. They're not going to read things differently. I can act in accordance to how I need to act and what I need to do to show up for these different things. And so just being able to be honest with people above all else of this is what's going on, or I need to move this for this. Are you open to this? Um, And again, that respect of people's time of as soon as I know something, I'm going to tell someone, even if it's 9 a.m. in the morning and there's something happening at 3 p.m. today, I even messaged someone that I have something later today. And I was like, I'm going to be 10 minutes late. And it's like, You could say that, oh, maybe I can make that 10 minutes up and maybe I'm not going to be. But I'd rather tell them I'm going to be 10 minutes late and then be on time and be all set to go than be stressed all day about am I going to make it? Is everything going to be okay? And trying to make up that time that like maybe I can't make up. Mm -hmm. And just being able to say that to someone of this is what's going on is only going to help because so far. So often we just take a narrative and we run with it in our head. We make up a story. We say how someone feels about us without them saying it. And if we can just all talk better, then a lot of that can be avoided. Uh, And a lot of it can just be, yeah, it can just be avoided as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. Communication is something that I feel like we've done a lot of work on, not only for ourselves, but obviously within PD and you know, with our friends and so on, it's been something that has seen so much growth because for for myself, I come from a background within my family that a lot of things were just swept under the rug and we move on to the next thing. And you are expected to just understand that the person apologizes and then everything's good. And that was a hard environment to come out of Mm -hmm. and work, work out of, uh, because it, that environment breeds a chronic level of people pleasing because you're trying to just please everyone around you and not acknowledge anything that would be negative. Whereas there's not, it's not a bad thing to address things that are negative. Mm -hmm. It's the best thing that you could do of just putting it on the table and saying, Hey, can we have some conversation on this and get on the same page of my, my feelings were hurt. Um, this thing happened and I just want to have some acknowledgement around it. How can we do better about this in the future? Why did this happen initially? And having that conversation is very powerful, but it also is such a strengthening exercise if both parties can come to the conversation with an open mind and no one is coming from a place of like, you're attacking me, you are X, Y, and Z. So that being said, I find that the communication is something that will always be evolving and always be improving, but we've made large strides. Yeah. And it just helps with within like, and not just within owning a business, but I mean, it's going to help for anyone in any stage of their life to communicate better. But especially within owning a business, I have found like the communication is so even that much more important because there's so many people and especially with so much of our team being remote, it's so easy with not having communication to create your own narrative and being able to just say, this is what's going on. Here's an update. Um, Let's touch base on this. Or even I had someone on staff asking for clarification about something. And I was just like, yep, here, here's the clarification. Let's talk on this. And they had said something of like, well, I just really don't want you to think that I'm doing bad or I'm not doing X, Y, and Z. And I was like, 
no, we, we've we talked about it. We've communicated about it. And this is something I understand the scenario. And yes, we have different ways to track performance, but it's also something that we're human centric and there's going to be circumstances that come up. And so as long as I understand the circumstance, I'm in a lot better spot to be able to lead correctly and to be able to answer questions correctly and create space if I need to, whatever it may need to be, of just being able to freaking talk about it, put it out there. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s, able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. Do you have another thing that you're detraining? Is there another characteristic? Well, I would say it's something I've mostly already detrained, but it's something I struggled with for many, 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 many years. And that was being negative. And not only just um, like my initial thought process being negative, but also being very negative towards myself um, and very much so of like self, not self-destructive, but I guess- Self-deprecating. Self, self-deprecating, self yeah, would be the better one there. Okay. So what what changed? How did you change it? I would say that a big part of this, like when we look at being negative or I guess negative self-talk as a whole, it was my default because I wasn't happy with who I was or what I was doing for the most part. Not to say like, oh, I was this awful person, but it was just like I wasn't happy with who I was and I wasn't happy in my life. And I think that a lot of that negative self-talk or just saying it to other people came from this place of, I want to acknowledge it first before someone else can. Because I also came from growing up, I did get bullied a decent chunk. And so it was something that it was kind of like, I want to beat this person to the punch, or I'm going to say it and try to be funny about it before someone else can. But like we talked about earlier, you can really talk things over yourself. And when I was so used to joking and so used to trying to make light of it or trying to get it out there before someone else, then I just started to really believe those things about myself. And it really dragged me down as a whole, um, as you can imagine. And it's something that um, I also got into a place of just like I... I would just get mad at myself because I, and I talked about earlier of like, it's very important to like self audit or self reflect, but I got to the point that I just started to blame myself for everything. And there's a few different things within like that negative self-talk that can happen. Um, And so you can have things like comparing and criticizing yourself, catastrophizing. um, And we've called things clumping before of like just putting everything together and overgeneralization, um, trying to forecast something or using should statements. And so I would just constantly be down on myself if I would make one mistake. And I'd be like, you're a piece of shit. You should have done that better. You've now ruined everything. And it would turn into this like slippery slope of just beating myself up. And then the more that you tell yourself those things, the more you believe that about yourself. And I just got to a place where I felt that I couldn't even trust myself because I wasn't allowing myself to trust myself because as soon as I made one mistake, I was the worst. I sucked. And why would anyone else want to trust me with anything because I can't even do this one simple thing? And it would just get into a really bad cycle of constantly getting mad at myself. And I feel like a big part of it is, well, there's a few parts of it, but 
recognizing that people make mistakes. And again, not using that as an excuse of you can just now write off everything you do because people make mistakes, but recognizing like I have 20 plus years of data showing me that that didn't get me to where I wanted to go. And I am a big person, especially now on data, but I'm also a big person on let me prove myself wrong or right. And so if it's something where I'm like, hey, I've done this for 20 plus years of being down on myself, being negative about myself and all of this, this hasn't made me more perfect. This hasn't made me better. This hasn't made me um, more uh, successful. I haven't gotten what I've wanted out of it. Let me just try something else. And it was something that I used of like, oh, people say you should do this or talk about yourself in this way or give yourself grace. I'm going to try it, but then I could always use it as, as if I go all in on this and it doesn't work, then I can say I tried it and it didn't work and this is bullshit. And so I had both ends of it. It was a win-win. I could either prove myself right of this is bullshit or even if I was proving myself wrong. It's like I ended up getting the desired result that I actually wanted. Mm -hmm. So did I actually lose anything at all? And so it was this aspect of like believing that I was capable and just not beating myself down in those instances and being able to say like, what's the next best step here? What needs to happen? So for an example of like waking up past my alarm, that would have been something that would have ruined my day in the past. I would have been a piece of shit for doing it. And it just would have been my whole entire narrative for the day. But now it's like, oh crap, I woke up late. That stinks. What needs to move in my schedule and what do I need to do to still make this the best day? And it's like the difference in those type of days is night and day, like spending a whole day where you're defined by you woke up late and you're a piece of shit versus, okay, this stinks. Maybe I need to address why I woke up past my alarm in another situation, but what needs to be done right now? to get to where I want to go. And just looking at it that way, instead of just catastrophizing everything, making everything so personal, making everything so polarizing, it's like, it doesn't have to be that way. It literally does not. You're making it that way. You are creating this for yourself. Mm -hmm. It's powerful. It's very powerful. Um, I I think that I've noticed that in, in you of seeing those improvements and not seeing you in in your way, fly off the handle in those situations. Like our flying off the handle is different um, in those situations where our emotions get the best of us. And I've seen that improve in you for the last, I don't know, six to six months to a year for sure. Well, thank you. It's just something that like just because you have a feeling doesn't mean you need to take it as a directive. Just because you have a feeling doesn't mean you need to necessarily do something about it. And I really try now to act in accordance to my values and not my feelings. And that doesn't mean that you're sweeping those feelings under a rug and you're forgetting about them and you're just like trying to ignore them. It means that you are acknowledging them and choosing to do something else. You're choosing to act in accordance to your values. You're choosing to set that to the side, maybe recognize, hey, I'm sad. I I need to deal with this, but right now this needs my attention. And I can get so much better at like compartmentalizing and understanding where my feet need to be, where my focus needs to be, what I need to be doing instead of being so in my mind. And that's something else. I know some people might not agree with this, but just being more busy helped to some degree. Like, of course, you can get too much in your thoughts as a whole, but because- I don't think it's, I don't think it's necessarily being, I think busy is the wrong term. Productive, would you say, or just- Task to accomplish things that you're focusing on. I think busy can be often yeah, misinterpreted of just like doing random stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm just like being a busy body and not yeah. not moving. I think that it's more of having things that are important to you that you are accomplishing throughout the day that you have spread throughout the entirety of your day that you're able to move from thing to thing and just be where your feet are. Yeah. Because I guess like if I really do look and compare, I just had too much time on my hands before that I would sit around, think about things, dwell on things, get in my head about things. And like if I look back to college of like, yes, I was taking multiple credit hours and had a job, but for some reason I still had all this time to just sit around and think and and do all that. And not that I don't take time to sit and think or sit and feel, but it's very different of like my mind needs to be focused in these areas.
ideas. And not that I, quote unquote, don't have time for feelings, but it's the aspect of, again, I still have feelings and I can still feel them and I can still validate them and all that jazz, but I can also choose to do nothing about it. And I don't have to take it as a directive of, oh, I feel tired I just or I feel lazy. I don't want to do this thing. It's like, okay, you can feel lazy and still do the thing. Right. You can feel scared. You can feel anxious and still do the thing. Mm-hmm. You can feel overwhelmed and still do the thing without it overtaking your entire day in life and mentality and personality. I would say one way that I worked out of that is by having the time blocks for the specific task that I would be doing. Because often when I would get bored or get in my own head is that I would be spending too much time on a particular task. When I already know that really the time allotment that I can give to sitting at my computer continuously is two hours. Like I have a really, really focused and efficient two hours of direct computer time before I need to go and do something else. I need to go get some water. I need to go on a walk. I need to do whatever it is. Um, I would find myself being self-deprecating or, or more negative when I was sitting there for three and four hours, noticeably getting less efficient with the task that I was working on. But I kept telling myself, like, I need to finish this, even though my work is getting worse but I need to keep sitting here and force myself to finish this right now rather than knowing that I have better efficiency for the two hours windows, having a small break and then just coming back to it and having another two hours that's far more useful than me sitting there for a continuous four. Yeah, and it's kind of like in that situation, you're pushing yourself into the box of I should sit here for four hours. And it's like, who set that? Who told you you needed to sit there for X amount of time? You're putting that on yourself when you can just look and say, what is going to work best for me in this situation? Correct. How do I need to show up for this? Um, instead of just thinking, like putting all these shoulds on yourself. I think that's another thing of like, I put a lot of shoulds and it's like, I I kind of get to write the rules to a certain degree. I get to decide what I should and shouldn't do and how that looks in my life. Mm-hmm. I can agree. Is there anything else that you feel like you're working on? Well, I feel like all of mine were all in one almost. Like mine being the the patience and then also being very emotionally driven. So those two things kind of go into one where I'm just a very emotional person. And I was very unwilling to accept that for a long time. Like or I was- label yourself that way. Right. I, I felt as though that by labeling myself as an emotional person, it was- a show of weakness, or it was a show that um, I'm not as manly as I should be or something along those lines. And I've come to find that that's certainly not the case, that a majority of males are tremendously emotional, but they're not willing to because of the same reason that I wasn't willing to say that I was. Um, And by understanding that, I'm able to be more aware of what my common responses to situations are and then be able to maneuver my way to a place of responding to situations as I know I should, or not necessarily should, but want to. And that has been a fun game for me to be able to identify and be aware of in different situations, and then be able to make what I believe to be the right decision in those moments, and being able to give myself praise in those moments as well of, hey, you made a decision where in the past you would have made a different decision or responded differently, you should be proud of yourself for this. This is a step in the right direction. And as I've become more aware of these things, I've also become much more um, much more excited by 1% improvements, where in my mind previously, I would always be thinking about what's the biggest way for me to improve. I'm trying to take the biggest chunk here. And that would often lead me to a place of burning the candle from both ends and then making huge strides, but then having to take huge strides back because I was so exhausted, beat up, whatever the case is. And now I'm just focused on being literally just a little bit better than I was yesterday and then just continuously seeing that. And I had seen graphs and things of that nature for so long talking about how the 1% approach was so much better than trying to take these big chunks. And I was like, 
that's for you guys. <laughs> Have <laughs> you seen you me? you can't do a bigger <laughs> Have jump. you seen me? No, I, I can do this. And uh, it just took me beating my head against a wall for 20 plus years doing it uh, to realize that, no, the 1% approach is significantly better. Um, and it really applies to almost all things, not just in the workspace, but also within your fitness journey, within all the different components and not trying to take like a uh, taking, and this is something I speak with new clients about because when we are starting out, there's a lot of things that are adjusting and they come to that first check-in wanting to be so perfect because they want to show up. They are so excited. They're motivated to work with me and they want to show me that they are the hard worker that I already know they are. Like I can see it through the onboarding. I can see it through all the other aspects. You don't have to show me because you've already, I know it's in you. And we're going to be able to pull it out as we work through this. But I'm in a place where it's like, I just want to see progression. I'm not trying to see perfection here. I just want to see you progress from what we had in place before we got started. Um, and that's, I, I always think a, a large relief for those clients that they come in is like that I actually have the opportunity to just keep making progress from week to week rather than it being perfection from start to finish. Yeah. And I think that that's another thing just in general that you've improved on is being able to celebrate the smaller wins because it used to be you go for these big things. Then when you accomplish them, you would think I should have already accomplished that and kind of brush it off, not give yourself any praise and then be like, what's next? And it's like, there's aspects of that of like, I love how big you dream. I love what you push yourself to to do. I, there's so many positives of that, but the negative was like you were never celebrating your wins and never celebrating things along the way. And I think that's even a big piece of motivation. I know we're not always going to be motivated, but when it comes to motivation, I actually do have a lot of like drive and motivation regularly because it's like, okay, this thing improved, this thing improved, this thing improved. And I get that motivation, that excitement from just being able to celebrate those things along the way instead of just looking into the vastness because that's where I feel like people lose motivation is they're look, looking at this vast space and they're like, how am I supposed to get from here to here? Or where am I even supposed to go? And it's like, if you just look at what's this next win that I can get, what's this next progression I can get, then it's a whole hell of a lot easier to stay motivated and to stay driven because you have that in front of you and you have those wins to celebrate. You could also look at it in a way that what is the daily habits that are going to get me to that thing? And then you just focus on those. Mm -hmm. And it's like that thing that you're working towards is going to come. You know that because you're doing these things. It's the journey, not the destination. That's right. <laughs> that is so right. We've got a bunch of uh, you know common quotes in this episode, I feel mm -hmm. like. But yeah. um, that is the the case. And, and also, I realized that by... Uh, not looking at everything as um, this all or nothing, we can call it that. I, I was afraid that I would lose the dreaming that I have, or I had to have all of it, or I had none of it, basically. And by taking a step back and understanding, like, the dreaming for me is never going to go away. Like, I see it for myself. I see it for other people. I, all I see is the potential of things. And I love that of myself. And I it excites me any time that I get an opportunity to talk about it. Um, so that's never going away. And once I came to understand that, I was like, okay, I can – Take off the uh, I can take off the gas a little bit. It's okay. I'm not going to lose the things that I love about myself by having more grace or being more present in the moment. I can have this, and I can also have you know parts of this that I enjoy, um, which was very helpful. Yeah, because that's just another example of you kind of putting yourself in a box of like I have to do it this way. Of like I have to put myself in a place that I'm a procrastinator in order to have these big dreams. I also have to have these downfalls, and it's like no, you can you get to change that. You can flip the script um, and write your own story. Just add another cliche in there. One association that I made that has been so helpful for me is that for me to accomplish the goals that I have, it requires me to be a professional in my space. For me to be a professional and what professionals do is that they handle the things that are always within their control, always. Whatever's within their control is taken care of. And that is through every pro that's ever been successful, that is the God's honest truth. And once I made that connection 
and I was like, I have to be a pro to do the things that I want to do. Well, then there's no negotiating the things that are within my control. And I just need to focus on these. And by creating that simple connection allowed my mind to calm down a lot, to lower the noise of all I'm trying to be is a top tier professional in my space. And the, and the things that I excel at, I want to be at the top. And that's what professionals do. That's what I'm going to do. And that's all I care about. And that has allowed me to be so much more calm. And it's so nice to finally quiet the noise because that's something that like, I feel like I just have so much more peace on it. it. Even if things are hectic, even if things are crazy and overwhelming, overall, I have way more peace because I'm not fighting myself. I'm not holding myself back. And there's not all these voices telling me what I should and shouldn't do. I mean, sometimes they're on social media, but it's this aspect of like, okay, I feel confident in what I'm trudging forward with. Absolutely. Well, thanks for having this combo yeah, with nice. me. That's nice. I love, I love you. So you. You're much. so amazing. You're I love so amazing. I love recording episodes yes, like this. And thank we you should for do this my shirt. Often. I know we should. Thank you for adding to my Rodman shirt collection. This is number three. Well, it's hilarious because the other two that you have were mine to begin with, and then you just stole them. No, I did not steal them. You got them. They were too small for you, and then I got them. And that's happened with a few things. So, like, keep not measuring things <laughs> to some degree. Sometimes I get frustrated. Keep you, impulse buying, please. <laughs> sometimes you won't measure things of like, oh, I. I want this to fit on this shelf. And it's like, that's 12 times too big. Yeah, I do that. But then sometimes it works in my favor. So I guess beggars can't be choosers. Yeah. I've <laughs> done that with the couch in the basement. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a lot, we can go around a lot of things. Yeah. Which if you're local to Columbus <laughs> and you want to buy a couch, <laughs> it's on Facebook Marketplace, but just DM me and I will work out something Please for a buy this couch. couch. <laughs> Please buy this couch. It's <laughs> so gently used i can't even express yeah, we used for maybe a month a brand new love sack couch it's it's beautiful it's comfortable all the things yeah all right well that's where we'll end if you want to buy our couch message us yeah. but otherwise make sure you share this make sure that you're like following us on the podcast platform whatever it is depending on the platform so that you are alerted when our new series comes out and you get all that jazz but otherwise we'll just be trucking along here and we'll catch you in the next one